Hi, I'm Judith Lucy, and I'm afraid I have to begin with an apology. I'm a competent, funny lady, but as most of you know when it comes to dance, I have a rare gift, and that is the one part of King of the Road that this recording could not capture. <laughs> well, how do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? The show begins with me tap dancing to Frank Sinatra's inspirational tune, New York, New York. Imagine Fred Astaire after a couple of Malibus, or even after some sort of accident where he can't feel his legs, and you might come close to picturing my tap dancing magic. The dance also explains why it sounds like I'm hyperventilating for the first 20 minutes of the show. All right then, pour yourself a stiff one or what the hell, maybe take something a little hallucinogenic, sit back and enjoy. New York, New York is actually the song they were playing in the airport cafeteria the day I discovered that I wouldn't be leaving for New York because of visa problems, <laughs> i.e. my travel agent told me I didn't need one, I'll be going back there. <laughs> so it was more a case of start spreading the news because I'm going to be leaving in about four or five days' time. <laughs> And you know, looking back, I really should have taken it as a little bit of a sign. But eventually got out of the country, did the big trip, and the really great news is, I've got some slides. <laughs> no, 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 I know what a couple of you are thinking. Look, Jude, slides are a bit dull, but I've got some corkers. <laughs> Statue of Liberty, <laughs> don't tell me you've seen that before. Coliseum, I've got about four or five hours of this stuff. It's going to be great. Oh, there I am in Africa. Um, I'm the white guy with the hat on. Oh, there I am. Who the fuck knows where? Oh, there I am in St Kilda. Oh, and how did that cheeky little shot get in there? That's me on Christmas Day, just before I found out I was adopted. So I was hanging out with a lot of lesbians in New York. I'd met Barbara, and then her ex-girlfriend came over, and her ex-girlfriend's girlfriend came over. Then Barbara's sister came over, and her girlfriend came over. So, you know, we're talking dicorama. <laughs> we've, um, we've all gone to the closing ceremony of the gay games, which was pretty weird, because you're in a stadium with 60,000 gays, and a woman stands up to sing the national anthem and introduces it by saying, and here's to America, where everybody is treated exactly the same. Now, Barbara, being the good old Australian that she is, just went, oh, bullshit, <laughs> and sat down. I, of course, was a lot more wishy-washy and Catholic about the whole thing, so, you know, I stayed standing, thinking, oh, well, I guess I am in their country, but, you know, then I got a bit bored and tired, so I sat down as well, which is when the man standing next to me has gone, well, that's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Rather unwittingly, I thought he was referring to the whole situation, so I've got, ha, isn't it? And that's when he's turned into a bit of a screaming beetroot and has said, look, you may not respect this country, but I do and I resent that. Which is when I've thought, well, hey, 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 let's take a little bit of a chill pill, you know. You're not living in home of the brave land of the free, you're living in la la land. But look, I've gone to that, I've gone on the lesbian march, I've been going to all these gay clubs, I've gone to see Go Fish, and I'm telling you, I was having a pretty hot time. I should probably say at this point in the show, though, that while I know a lot of people in the past have assumed that I am gay, well, because like most lesbians, I do enjoy ripping men's testicles off with my teeth, <laughs> putting them in a vice and squeezing them till they pop, so, you know, easy mistake to make. But... Actually, about the only lesbian experience I've had was one night when a very good friend and I got very drunk and started off by telling each other, 
how much we loved each other <laughs> as friends. And then before you know it, we were rolling around on the carpet with our tongues down each other's throats before we passed out. Next day, we've both been incredibly hungover. In fact, my friend has thrown up all day. In fact, she told me she threw up every time she thought of me kissing her. <laughs> So, you know, not the kind of experience that's really going to make you rush out and buy the K.D. Lang collection. But I was having a lovely time with those chicks in the Big Apple, and I'm going to be honest with you, when it came to the old sexuality, it was all getting pretty confusing. So consequently, when this guy has started chatting me up in the street, every heterosexual fibre in my body has screamed, I don't care if he's a psycho, give him your number! <laughs> So I've given him my number and we've wound up meeting at the cafeteria in the hotel where I was staying. I've ordered a black coffee and he's ordered a turkey burger. Now, apparently it was an exceptionally good turkey burger. Wow, that's a great turkey burger. This is one of the best turkey burgers I've ever eaten. Do you eat turkey burgers? This turkey burger is great. I have never been so physically repulsed by watching someone eat something in my entire life. And let me tell you, what my mother can do with a container of yogurt in her dentures is pretty extraordinary. But you know, it was one of those things he just kept talking while he was eating, half it was going over him, half it was going over me. It was just disgusting. And unfortunately, the topic he decided to explore while eating the burger was women. He told me how he'd just come out of another totally fucked relationship <laughs> in a completely different accent. <laughs> Which, uh, took me by surprise. You imposter. Uh, and basically said that the only reason he wanted my phone number was so he could have sex and leave it at that. In fact, could we pop up to my hotel room and have sex right now? I told him I was gay. Four months before I went overseas, I found out I was adopted. A little bit of a cake tag. Found out on Christmas Day, which was fantastic, because it was like, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. We're not your parents, your real mum gave you away. Hey! <laughs> So, you know, at least it was festive. No, I, um, I didn't find out quite like that, but uh, it was a family Christmas. And golly, don't you love those? Let's get a whole group of people together who haven't seen each other all year, who have nothing in common. Let's get them to drink a keg of beer each and then tell each other what they really think of each other. Just so relaxing. So, not surprisingly, it did come out after a little bit of a family tiff. I mean, you know, nothing too serious, just my father trying to beat the crap out of my brother while screaming, I'm going to kill you, you fucking cunt. Which, which was a little bit upsetting, because I think women should be trying to reclaim the word cunt, but you know, I thought, not the time to mention it. So... That's pretty much cleared the room, as you can imagine. And I've been left chatting to my sister-in-law and I've said, golly, you've married into a fun family. And she's gone, there's something else you don't know. <laughs> and I've been like, don't tell me Santa isn't real. <laughs> but a boom, but a bang. And she said, no, it's just got to do with you. <laughs> And, you know, let's face it, basically I've guessed, because how many things can it be? Oh, my God, I'm blind and nobody told me! I think the worst thing about it was that it made me feel pretty stupid because it had never entered my head. Despite the fact that as a child, my mother gave me this speech all the time for what I thought was no apparent reason. You know, adopted children are the luckiest children in the world <laughs> because their parents really want them and they're specially chosen. And you know, I'd be watching the TV and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Glad I'm not one of those freaks. <laughs> should, um, should probably tell you a little bit about mum and dad. 
They came out from Ireland about 40 years ago and unfortunately they've just never really gone, oh, look, honey, we're in a different country and it's the 20th century. <laughs> They're unusual people. Uh, Dad's fond of a cocktail. In recent years, he's had to start doing his drinking on the sly. So he has actually started to pop his brandy into his chicken cuppa soup. Mm. I'm going to give it a go. Next time I go to the bar, I'm going to say, look, I want a brandy, a dry scotch and coke, and I'll bugger it. Make mine a vodka and a chunky pea and ham soup, thanks. <laughs> this is another story that might put you in the ballpark with Dad. You know how every now and then you slip up and make the mistake of telling your parents what you're actually thinking? I admitted to my father once that I'd been feeling a bit depressed lately. And Dad has turned to me without skipping a beat and has said, do you think you'd be happier if you had a breast reduction? <laughs> and I had to say, well, no. But I might be happier if you had a lobotomy. Because, you know, I really couldn't understand how he had made that leap from point A, which was my child is unhappy, to point B, which was so obviously she should have her jugs lops. <laughs> Mum's no day at the beach either, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm telling you, in primary school, a little bit of an overprotective mother, in primary school I wore so much underwear, I'm amazed I remained vertical. But, really... The main thing was that I'm afraid as a child we had a bit of an odd pad thing going on in our house. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I'm talking sanitary napkins. Mum was a freedom girl. And uh, look, back then we're not talking discreet. You know, we're not talking whisper. We're talking yell it from the fucking rooftops. I've got a carton of cigarettes in my underpants. She obviously didn't want to be caught short. Because I am telling you, you could not open a drawer in our house without an enormous white brick just leaping up and hitting you in the head. Really, you could be in the kitchen, you could be in the shed. It didn't matter, I thought they were breeding. Back to being adopted, after all of the hoo-ha died down a bit, I actually said to Mum, Mum, why didn't you tell me I was adopted? And she said, I forgot. <laughs> Which wasn't really the answer I was chasing. Took, um, took a bit of a different tack with Dad. I said, Dad, why did you adopt me? And he said, well, because I wanted a daughter. And I said, look, Dad... <clears throat> Not that it's any of my beeswax, but did you ever think about making a baby with mum? Because my brother's not adopted. Oh, well, as far as we know, probably this Christmas is treat. <laughs> and Dad has honestly turned to me and said, Oh. Now that you mention it, I guess it is a bit unusual your mother didn't suggest that. So who knows, really. But I will tell you one thing. I was out for sympathy. I'm sorry. It's not something you find out every day of the week. But all my friends have reacted in exactly the same way, especially the ones that know my family really well. They've all gone, Oh, my God, you're adopted. You must be so relieved. <laughs> I've always been completely obsessed with Americans, which is why I just thought I would have this immediate connection with New York. But basically, I was staying in the Lower East Side. I had never left Australia before. I knew nobody, had no idea what I was doing. People were offering me um, smack and crack on street corners. <coughs> there weren't a lot of white people where I was staying. There were a lot of blacks and Puerto Ricans. But it wasn't like Sesame Street. Oh no! 
No cute little Oscar the Grouch in my garbage can. Probably just some kid on crack with a gun. I've seen New Jack City. I've seen Boys in the Hood. I've seen Do the Right Thing. I know about blacks and violence and drugs. They're going to know I'm white. They're going to know I'm a tourist. They're going to want to kill me. Yes, it wasn't until I left our fair shores, and boy do I mean fair, that I discovered what a complete racist I actually am. Got over my initial hysteria, which meant I had to do a lot of overcompensating, which meant I just became incredibly patronising. <laughs> so if a black person asked me the time in the street, I'd be like, oh, look, I don't have a watch, but I can find out. I've seen all of Spike Lee's movies, and I think they're terrific. Isn't Wesley Snipes an excellent actor? I was saying that to my friend Vita the other day. She's black. I know quite a few black people, actually. <laughs> Shoot me now. And to make matters worse, a friend gave me some really tippity-top advice before I left. She said, Judith, whatever you do, don't ask for a black coffee because it's not very politically correct. So like a dick, I am walking into these cafes and I'm like, coffee, please. And they're like, well, what sort of coffee? <laughs> normal. Just a normal cup of coffee, thanks. Well, what, like a cappuccino? No, no milk, I don't want a white, thanks. So you want a black coffee? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. But just because I want a black coffee doesn't mean I think it's going to be a really great dancer. <laughs> I kind of went off stand-up comedy when I was in New York. Well, to be completely honest with you, I had a career change every time I popped on the telly. I'd be like, duh, L.A. Law. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, I actually used to ask the audience what they thought I was singing, and uh, the night a man yelled out the theme from Lassie... <laughs> I thought, maybe I'll stop asking the audience. But I'd be watching L.A. Law and I'd be like, that's it, I'm giving up comedy and I'm going to become a lawyer. Because, oh, yay, hi, I'm a lawyer and I'm a bit happy with myself. <laughs> because I think half the trouble with travelling is you've just got a little bit too much time on your hands. And I reckon if you start to think about anything too much, you start to go a bit nuts. I remember when I was at school... It's a lovely shot, isn't it? I've gotten a lot of dates out of that one. Um, any, other, any other Catholics in tonight? Yes. Oh, and proud. I went to a Catholic school, and this is true. Our headmistress's name was Sister Sheila. And we were actually busting out with nuns like that. We had Sister Sheila, Sister Bloke, um, Sister Victoria Bitter. She was great. She'd come in in the morning and she'd go, yeah, you can get it pull on a plow, you can get it taken a vow. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've got it right now. But we had this nun come and give us a chat about how she'd received the call. And she told us how for her last five years of school she had a two-mile walk to her bus stop and every time she did this walk she'd ask herself, should I become a nun? As you do. And then... At the end of the five years, she's woken up one morning and she's gone, yes, I will become a nun. So I've been thrilled with this story. I've rushed home to tell my brother and he's just gone, Judith, that's the most ridiculous story I've ever heard. And frankly, if she'd asked herself a different question that many times, she could have woken up one morning and gone, yes, I will become a juggler. But, <laughs> but I think one of the other reasons I went off comedy is because there is so much of it over there. You know, it's like on the TV the whole time. It's on MTV, Comedy Central. And I'm sorry, most of it's pretty terrible. Although I did see one really good documentary on black female comics, which was hilarious. Oh, excellent. Very good. Aren't those ethnic minorities doing some terrific things? <laughs> the comp air was hilarious, and pardon me. Because what I love about this costume is it just gradually rides up as the night goes along. But um, the comp air was great, and she was saying things like, any of you motherfuckers out there, well then, let's give it up for this next black bitch. Let's hear it say, hello. And I was sitting there watching it thinking, Jesus Christ, Jeff, imagine if you tried to bring on someone like that. You know, I'd be like, any motherfuckers out there? <laughs> Got a very funny bitch, sorry for you now, say, hi! Don't think it'd really work, but... And I hope you've noticed that these are kind of control tops too, which are... <laughs> Pretty sexy, I've even got a reinforced toe. But 
saw a lot of live comedy too and that started to drive me a bit insane because it was mostly men and it seemed like they'd all read the same How to Be a Comedian in Several Easy Steps book. <laughs> Step one, always have just come back from somewhere. So I just got back from Texas. Step two, ask if anyone in the audience is from that place. So is anybody here from Texas? Step three, insult them. So, hey lady, are you sleeping with your brother too? Step four, always suck up to the place you've just arrived in. But it's great to be back in New York. Please note they should be whooping and cheering at this point. Step five, discuss your marital status. 5A, if married, insult your wife. So there's nothing wrong with the Institute of Marriage that banning women from it wouldn't fix. 5B1, these are all jokes I heard. 5B1, if single, have just broken up with your girlfriend. So I just broke up with my girlfriend. The relationship lasted two weeks. Took her that long to chew through the ropes. 5B2, or have difficulty meeting women because you're so ugly. So I don't meet women. I'm a big guy. They're jealous of me. I got bigger tits than they do. Step six, when in doubt, just discuss your penis. Heaven, so much colour and movement in this show. <laughs> so, I was going through money hand over fist in New York, so I've thought, oh, I know, I'll go to Mexico. No idea. I've walked into the travel agent, she's been like, are you travelling on your own? Yeah, you want somewhere single, somewhere jumpy? Well, actually, no, I don't. Cancun! You'll love Cancun, we've got one ticket left, you leave in two days. I hated Cancun. Cancun was like full of American college kids and may I say, I'm never knocking a movie like Porky's or Big Jugged College Babes again because they're not movies, they're documentaries. <laughs> there was a Burger King on every corner and if a Mexican couldn't speak perfect English, the Americans assumed they must have been a few beans short of a burrito. You know, it was like, matches, Rafino, matches. Don't you know what matches are? Jesus, what's wrong with these people? So, I didn't speak to anybody for six days. By the last day, I'm starting to go a bit, what? So I've checked myself out of my really cheap package deal hotel into a really expensive one because that's what you do when you're trying to save money. <laughs> I've been there for about an hour when a guy who worked in the hotel has just rung me up and asked me out for dinner. Now, I'd never laid eyes on him, but I went, sure! <laughs> he turned out to be a kind of tall Mexican Barney Rubble. <laughs> and look, Barney was great, but Barney kept trying to kiss and fondle me and told me not to be alarmed that this was just the Mexican way. So I explained to him that kneeing him in the groin was just the Australian way and popped back to the hotel where I've gone, oh, I know, I'll drink a week's worth of margaritas in one evening. Don't worry, had a drinking partner, you know, in true... I'm travelling, better talk to someone I normally wouldn't piss on if they're on fire tradition. I have struck up a conversation with a man who'd referred to me very loudly to the barman as the sad, lonely girl at the end of the bar. The bar's shut and I've asked for one more margarita because I really needed it. And the barman said, no, look, can't do that, but hey, do you want to come to a disco with me when I finish work? Sure! So I've gone upstairs to make a quick phone call to a friend in Australia. I've come back down and the barman's been there with his friend, Yeri. Now, I know his name was Yeri because all night he kept saying to me, you know, Yeri, as in Tom and Yeri. <laughs> Oh, so once I'd stitch my sides back together. Uh, 30 seconds after I've arrived, the barman's announced that he has to take a piss and has disappeared behind the bush. Now, 
I don't know what happened behind that bush, but we never saw him again. <laughs> Yeri's been like, don't worry about him. He knows where the disco is. He'll just see us there. So I've gone to the disco. There's been a bit of dancing going on. And uh, you know the most incredible thing? Every time I asked for a drink, two would appear. And I remember sitting there with a very knowing grin on my face thinking... <sighs> That Yeri is trying to get me pissed so he can get me into the sack. <laughs> he must think I came down in the last shower. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, woke up the next morning with the hangover from hell, running really late for my plane, and let me tell you, they weren't the kind of airline you took risks with. Air Carnivale. <laughs> A woman on the way over had specifically requested a vegetarian meal and she'd been given a packet of crisps. <laughs> so... I get to the airport, I just make my plane, I feel like I'm gonna throw up, I'm putting my luggage in the overhead compartment when all of a sudden I notice two of the largest men that I have ever seen. Just incredibly tall, incredibly broad. One is crammed in the window seat, the other is crammed in the aisle. Flesh is spilling everywhere. And I remember thinking to myself, poor sucker that's got to sit between those guys for five hours. Ole. I haven't just been getting into outer travel. Oh no. I'm a little bit deeper than that. I've been doing some inner travel as well. I've recently taken myself off to one of those new age stores because they were offering massages. So I've thought, oh, great. And the guy's been like, well, would you like an all-over body massage? And I'm thinking, in for a penny. <laughs> so I'm lying on my stomach and he's getting pretty firm with my buttocks. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a bit weird, but it's probably quite standard. <laughs> I've... <laughs> flipped over onto my back and you know I've had a towel covering anything that could be a bit raunchy and he was massaging my legs and I remember briefly thinking oh surely he's not going to massage my stomach and breasts and then bang the towel's come down it's been on for young and old now I'm quite confident that I speak for most women in this room when I say that I don't feel that I carry a lot of tension in my breasts. Are you with me? I don't come home from a particularly stressful day and go, oh, my jugs could do with a good rub. I don't have a basin with bubbling hot water that I lower them into and go, ah, that's better. And, um, that was only the one-hour massage. There was a two-hour one available. Could have sorted out my tense vulva problem. But, um... It actually reminded me of a story that I saw when I was watching the pornographic channel in my hotel room in New Zealand because there's not much else to do, um, about a man in Italy who, instead of reading palms, reads women's breasts. And, you know, God love him. He does it for free. You know, just when you're starting to get a little cynical about humanity, a Samaritan like that comes along. He just wants to give. But... I haven't been put off by my massage. I've seen an ad for a New Age festival and I thought, I'll take myself off to that. I've had the lot done. I've had a sand reading done. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with sand readings. I certainly wasn't. Let me explain. A sand reading is essentially when you give a thundering moron $20 so you can plunge your hands into a bucket of dirt and they can give you a reading like this. This is exactly what this woman has said to me. She's gone... I'm getting your guardian. Her name's Marion. She's very keen on pot plants. Are you keen on pot plants? No. She's telling me you're about to start studying? No. 
oh, she's telling me you're very worried about a medical condition. No. And around about that point, I did feel like leaning forward and saying, look, she's telling me that you wouldn't know whether your ass was on fire. And it was a little bit of a shame because in the past I've had some quite good readings done. I actually had one done by a very strange Russian woman at the Paddington Markets in Sydney and, you know, according to her, I'm living till I'm 99, I'm going to be happy, successful, rich, just, you know, all the stuff you want to hear. So I've been with a couple of friends and I've skipped up to them and, well, not literally, that would have looked a little silly, but I've walked up to them and I've said, look, you've got to talk to this Russian woman. Okay, she's a bit strange, but guys, I'm telling you, for 10 bucks, she is going to make you feel fantastic. Well, she told my first friend that he was mentally challenged. She's gone, I'm sorry, but you are short in the mind. My second friend, she has told her that she would have only one child, that he would be a heroin addict who would break into her home at the age of 18 and steal everything from her. Yes, even the curtains. <laughs> Because uh, we all know what money hot curtains can fetch. <laughs> and then has told her that if she ever sleeps in the fetal position or eats baked beans again, she will die. <laughs> so golly, I was popular that day. But I did not leave that festival empty-handed. Oh no. I picked myself up a copy of a book called The Goddess in the Bedroom. <laughs> Like I need it. <laughs> Written by Susanna, silent Z before the S, E, Budapest. And oh no, Suze actually tells us in the book that she's changed her name to Budapest so that no matter where she is in the world, she'll always remember where she was born. Long-term memory problem. <laughs> it's one of those books where there's an awful lot of self-pleasuring talk. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against self-pleasuring. Goodness knows there have been times in my life where I've nearly rubbed my clitoris clean off. <laughs> oh, look. No, I, I can't quite believe I say that either. <laughs> but, um... <clears throat> there are an awful lot of tips in the book. And one of the tips is, if you're too nervous to buy a vibrator... There are alternatives in your own kitchen. Well, I don't think she means a Maggi mix. No, she suggests a cucumber. But she says you should use a condom because even though there's no sperm involved, <laughs> you learn something every day. Honestly. The number of vegetables I've accused of getting me pregnant... <laughs> so stupid but no she says you should use a condom because of pesticides and you know while part of me thought oh Suze what a lovely handy hint the other part of me couldn't help getting this immediate mental image of Good Lord, I don't know. Maybe you live in a share house or something, you know. One of your housemates walks into your bedroom, sees a couple of used condoms on the floor, glances up to the bed and, hey, call me crazy, but maybe expecting to see something living. <laughs> and instead they see something that's going to make them feel quite differently about Greek salad. <laughs> but I was unstoppable. Then I had to buy a copy of a magazine called Conscious Living, which is a bit of a hippie trippy magazine, and I'm sorry, I had to flick straight to the tantric sex article. <laughs> this is the rather raunchy part of the show. And there was a paragraph in there that really did knock the whole New Age thing on the head for me forever, because in the paragraph they suggest that instead of using the word vagina, we should use the phrase sacred space. <laughs> it gets better. Instead of using the word penis, we should use the phrase wand of light. <laughs> now, sure, handy in a blackout. <laughs> but I've got to say that most of the men that I know are kind of happy enough with their penises as it is without thinking they can go and do battle with Darth Vader. <laughs> A few years
years back, I met an American guy called Doug Corr. And Doug told me that in America, you can get sandwiches the size of your head. <laughs> he said, look, there are little old ladies and they're sitting down to sandwiches the size of their goddamn heads. <laughs> and he was right. There's like half a pig in every sandwich. It's just extraordinary. Not as extraordinary as Doug, though. Doug was pretty extraordinary. He met a very shy friend of mine. You know, one of those people who's very quiet when you first meet them. And Doug has decided to put her at ease by leaning over a table full of people and going, so, hey, what's the matter with you? Are you some kind of deaf mute? So remember that line for your shy friends. But. I've wound up going to a couple of people's houses when I was in America, and that was pretty weird. I was invited to this barbecue in New Jersey that was given by a couple of Scientologists. <laughs> Gee, I was moving in some racy circles. But, you know, we're talking the heart of suburbia, middle of the day, families, middle-aged couples. I've been there for half an hour when I've turned around to see that the hostess and her best friend have taken all their clothes off and are doing star jumps. Nikki Nuna across the lawn. <laughs> now, I don't know what your family Barbies were like, but we got pretty excited when Dad wore sandals without the knee-high socks. <laughs> so I wasn't really prepared for that. But in contrast to that, I've gone to a birthday brunch in the East Village, which was actually <laughs> pretty groovy. And it was given by my friend Vita for her ex-boyfriend, Steve. And now Vita is one of the tiniest human beings I've ever met. She's just really small, she's incredibly thin, she's just... Oh, look, she showed me her bra one day and I nearly broke down and wept. I just thought, I couldn't use that as an eye patch. <laughs> Steve, on the other hand is enormous. And I wasn't really warming to Steve because when Steve wasn't trying to pop his hand up Vita's skirt, he was turning to me and going, hey, I really like the way you can see your bra through your dress. I really like your legs and you reach your skirt a bit higher so I can see your thighs. It is my birthday. <laughs> and that's when you said, get fucked. <laughs> right, Judith? No, I have sat there going, <laughs> well, I guess it is his birthday. It's just a joke, right? I am a stranger in a strange country. But then he's gone. No, it was great going out with Vita because it was a bit like pumping a 12-year-old. And that's when someone else at the party has gone, if you keep talking like that, I'm going to call the police. And I thought, isn't it a pity that you can't actually charge someone with being a fuckwit? <laughs> This is a lovely story. Uh, Yeri, the Mexican, actually reminded me a little of a heterosexual man who picked me up one night in a gay nightclub because he thought I was a transvestite. <laughs> oh, not every girl can make that boast. I wasn't even wearing this outfit. I'll give you a bit of background. I had just seen the Mambo Kings. Has anyone seen that with Armand de Santa and Antonio Banderas? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think you might know what I'm talking about because I'd seen the movie and I had convinced myself that if I could meet some kind of Latin lover who could do the rumba, all my problems would be solved. So I've been at this gay club. My friends have gone off for a dance and through my margarita haze, I've become quite enchanted with this dark-skinned guy with a really thick accent. In fact, I've become so enchanted that we've started to have a bit of a pash which uh, must have looked a little unusual to the regulars, you know, unless they thought I was a man as well. <laughs> but I've given him a phone number and I've skipped home on cloud nine. My housemate's been really excited for me. She's been like, Jude, that's fantastic. What's his name? <laughs> you know I'm not good with names. <laughs> that's okay. Um, what does he do? No, that's gone as well. Oh, don't worry about any of that. What does he look like? <laughs> Shit, you're asking some toughies. Um, look, I'm not sure, but I think he looks a lot like Antonio Banderas in the Mambo Kings. Next day, he's rung me up and asked me out for dinner. Now, I've been upstairs putting my lipstick on. The doorbell's gone. My housemate's gone to answer it. And, you know... All I really needed to hear was the way she yelled up to me, Judah, he's here. 
to know I'd made a very big mistake. <laughs> now, look, he turned out to be a lovely person, but let's just say they probably weren't flipping a coin to decide whether he or Antonio got the role in Evita. <laughs> We're talking four feet tall, we're talking centre part, we're talking top lip, didn't know whether I wanted that moustache or not. Uh, open neck shirt, gold chains, a pair of the pointiest shoes I have ever seen on a man. <laughs> Could have cut bread with those babies. <laughs> Idle the Turk. He's popped out to the car and my housemate's been laughing so hard, she's fallen on the floor. <laughs> We've gone to the restaurant and look, his English wasn't great, so the whole evening the conversation was a bit like French for beginners. You know, where is the pen? The pen is on the desk of my uncle. <laughs> I really was asking him questions like, so, what kind of music do you like? And he's gone, I like the Dara Straits, but uh, mainly I like the Turkish music. And then, in the middle of the restaurant, at the top of his voice, he has started to go, um, um, hey, hey, um, hey, hey, and I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> Golly! <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it means the moonlight, it shines on my bazooki. <laughs> I should tell you that the only English word he was using with any degree of regularity was the word girlfriend. And around about the bazooki moment, I did find myself thinking, it'd be so much easier to have sex with you than a conversation. <laughs> so I've gone, I guess at this point in the show, I probably need to add, I was sober. Look, I'm not your girlfriend. I'm never going to be your girlfriend but let's have sex and then you can drop me home. And that's exactly what happened. And I've got to say, A, the sex was pretty good and B, I reckon it's about the one time in my life I've had sex with a man with no emotional investment whatsoever and it felt fantastic. <laughs> Love telling that story because it's always interesting. I always think to myself, I wonder what percentage are thinking that poor, desperate, drunken slut. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've pretty much gone straight to Scotland after America, but I had a couple of days in London and I thought, I don't want to miss my plane, so I know I'll catch a cab to Gatwick Airport. For those of you who don't know, that's a little bit like saying, oh, look, I know, I'll just hop in a cab from Melbourne to Adelaide. <laughs> cost me $140 and I missed my plane. Uh, got to Edinburgh eventually, thought it was really beautiful, loved it. In fact, that's where I was giving up comedy to become a travel agent. I'd actually gone there in the first place to, you know, check out the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Three weeks of drinking, flirting and craziness. And to catch up with a rather special Scottish boy that I'd met in Melbourne. Let's just call him Jock. Uh, I actually picked him up with the incredibly smooth line, I have some ecstasy, would you like some? <laughs> Pretty foolproof, I can tell you. I think on the whole he had a very nice time in Australia, apart from the fact that my friend seized every opportunity to go, Ah, chum so jumpy, you can curl it! <laughs> he loved that. <laughs> Never got sick of it. But um, well, I might have to tell you a bit of a raunchy story about he and I. You lucky devils. While we were going out in Australia, a friend of mine was in a relationship that I knew was particularly H-O-T. So one day I've said to her, I've said, oh, good Lord, what do you two get up to? And she said, well, what really turns me on is when he ties me to the bed, blindfolds me, leaves the room, the sense of anticipation is fantastic, and then he comes back and we have really great sex. So I've gone back to this guy and I've been like, oh, I don't know, let's give this a go. So... <laughs> I'm tied to the bed. We don't have a blindfold, so I've got a pillowcase over my head. So, you know, already I'm feeling pretty silly. He leaves the room and, goodness me, the sense of anticipation was so fantastic that the next thing I heard was, Judith, Judith, are you awake? <laughs> I'd completely passed out. <laughs> Sexual volcano. <laughs> but uh, if only we'd been getting on that well in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs>
I'd been there for a few months and we were getting on unbelievably badly. So finally I've said to him, look, do you think we should have a bit of a chat about how the relationship's going? And he's gone, yeah, let's break up. <laughs> so the conversation was a little shorter than I'd anticipated. <laughs> But of course, because we'd broken up, that meant that we actually had more sex in the next 24 hours than we had in the last three months. And that meant that for the next month, I had the most chronic case of cystitis and thrush that I've ever had. Was it the month of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival? <laughs> yeah! But you know, who wants to go see shows, meet people and generally have a really great time when you know you can just sit at home, watch a bit of telly, pop a few antibiotics and walk around with a hot water bottle rammed between your legs. <laughs> Not me. But out of all the places I went to, Ireland was the place I was convinced I was going to feel at home. I think I felt like that because all my life I've had to listen to my parents and my grandmother rave on about Ireland. You know, like I said, haven't been back for 40 years, but it's like they've never left. Gran still does little jigs in the kitchen, still sings things like, if you're Irish, come into the parlour. She's great, Gran, actually. She's the kind of woman who, as a child, you'd skip up to and go, how are you, Gran? And she'd go, lovey, I'm just waiting to die. <laughs> and you kind of always wanted to go, not as much as the rest of the family is, Gran. But no, Ireland was the place, I was giving up comedy and I was just going to work in a bar in Dublin and be happy for the rest of my life. Well, of course, nothing happened in Ireland. You know, nothing particularly good, nothing particularly bad. It was kind of like being in Tasmania, except everyone spoke like my grandmother and cooked like my mother. <laughs> I mean, not that mum didn't try. As a kid, almost every night of the week, mum would say, come on, kids, dinner's ready, and tonight it's... And honestly, she could say anything from beef vindaloo to sushi, and every night it would be stew. <laughs> My mother could cook nothing but stew and corned beef and cabbage, and even then, she wasn't shy of a packet or a can. I was well into my late teens before I discovered that mashed potato wasn't made out of powder. <laughs> I had thought it was just my mum, but I went to Ireland and I think the general idea is, look, why cook a vegetable for 10 minutes when you can start boiling it on Tuesday and maybe chow down on it Friday night? And if you don't eat it, you can just turn it into a bit of paper mache. They actually have a chain of Italian restaurants over there called Paddy Garibaldi's. <laughs> Tastes as good as it sounds. But the turning point came for me in Ireland one day when I was in a bar. <laughs> what a surprise. And I was talking to the barman, and in the middle of what I was saying, I've just lost my train of thought. And he's gone, oh, it must have been a lie then. And I've thought, no, it wasn't a lie. And that's precisely the kind of inane drivel I've had to listen to from my grandmother for years, and it's always driven me crazy. I just suddenly thought, who am I kidding with this island thing? Who was I ever kidding? What did I think was going to happen? I was going to be in the country for four days and Bono was going to give me the keys to Dublin? <laughs> I mean, as it's turned out, I'm probably part Lithuanian and, you know, who cares? <laughs> ah, Roma. Well, Rome was the place where I was giving up comedy to teach English. Would have been a bit tricky because I wouldn't have been able to see. I wouldn't have been able to see because of the bag I wanted to pop over my head because I just felt like the biggest frump in the world compared to all those groovy Italians. <laughs> Didn't have that problem in the UK. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Rome, it's just so beautiful, it's so romantic. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. What a pity that that was the place where my relationship with Jock just really went into decline. There was so much tension, and I was putting more energy into lying in a bed next to Jock without actually touching him than I ever had in a game of pick-up sticks. <laughs> you remember, but pick-up sticks was a pretty tense game. 
We were suffering from that problem where, you know, one of you comes out with a really clear, well-structured, well-thought-out sentence, and yet somehow by the time it reaches the other person's ears, it's just... Okay, so the plan was I was going to live in London and do stand-up comedy. I found London a little bit depressing. <laughs> Probably not helped by the fact that I was covered in eczema the entire time I was there for the first time in my life. Let me do a bit of a sickness checklist for you, actually. A New York cold, stomach bug, Mexico diarrhea, UK cystitis, thrush, dander of constipation, two really bad flus and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> Having a ball. I must say, though, one thing. You think the English are going to be a bit repressed. Well, I did anyway, but I tell you, the first week I was there, a man has come up to me in a bar and has gone, my mate really likes your ass. Can he fuck you? Can he fuck you up the ass?" <laughs> And I've just thought, excuse me? That's not the kind of behaviour I expected after watching Brideshead Revisited. I don't think Jeremy Irons would talk to me like that. At least the comedy went well. <laughs> well, the comedy actually did go quite well until I performed for a bunch of Aussies at a Sunday session. And we've mocked this comic Judith Lucy Boot off stage article up, but the bit where it says that calls from the crowd that Miss Lucy was a fucking boring and ugly boring dyke bitch are <laughs> quite accurate. <laughs> it seems like there are two kinds of Australians in London. You know the kind that don't want to have anything to do with any other Australians. They've only been there for a week, but they're already speaking like Prince Charles. And the other kind who speak a bit more like Delvine Delaney when she made her guest appearance on The Love Boat. Now, I don't know if any of you saw that, but Delvin was getting around saying things like, flip a couple of billy lids. You know, the sort of stuff we all say all the time. And I think they're the Australians the taxi driver was referring to, and he said to me, you know, out of all the tourists we get in London, I hate Australians the most. <laughs> thought, thanks for sharing, but I don't think we're helped by some of the Forex advertising campaigns that are on over there. There's one with a princess kissing a frog. Frog turns into a typical Australian male, so of course singlet hat with corks. He kisses her, she turns into a can of Forex, and he says, you haven't got a sister, have you? <laughs> A, uh, a very proud moment. I saw that in a cinema, and what stopped me from just springing up and bursting into Advance Australia Fair, I'll never know. But I was pretty depressed in London, and it was one of those things where I didn't really want to hang out in the Aussie Kiwi tent at the German beer festival urinating on people. But I was pretty homesick, so I did start acting a bit oddly. Started speaking a bit like Jack Thompson. Uh, started listening to an awful lot of cold chisel. <laughs> tuned into the young doctors whenever I could. Ba -da 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 -da. But the point came when I knew I needed help and it was time to go home. When I've actually stayed in one night to watch a film called Blood Oath and I have actually found myself sitting there thinking, I don't know why he's gotten so much bad press. I think Brian Brown's an excellent actor. <laughs> sophisticated Australian, a New Zealander, that's right. The highlight of my trip there, I think, was when I was strip searched at Auckland. I mean, you know, <laughs> hoping for a bit of action in New Zealand, but I didn't think I'd be fucking nude before I got out of the airport. Oh! <laughs> they have found a trace of marijuana in a packet of tobacco that I was carrying. <laughs> How did that get there? <laughs> a setup. So... Oh. oh, I'm outraged. So then they've had to go through all my luggage and then I've had to get my gear off for a couple of female customs officers who, I'm sorry, made vinegar tits from Prisma <laughs> look pretty happy-go-lucky. 
It's a fairly humiliating situation to be in, lifting your breasts up so that a total stranger can check that you don't have any cocaine strapped underneath them. <laughs> and phew, what luck that for once I didn't. <laughs> so, you know, I've been trying to crack a few jokes. I'm like, oh, this is a bit embarrassing, isn't it? And they're like, well, what do you expect if you're going to bring illegal substances into the country? Then they've herded me off to see the police sergeant who has looked at me with absolute disgust and has gone, well, you realise there's not even enough here for a joint, don't you? <laughs> Sorry for ruining your evening, officer. <laughs> and then has turned to me and gone, and you also realise I could put you on a plane straight back to Australia and never let you into New Zealand again. And I have wanted to go, yes, but aren't you meant to be punishing me? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, um, I still don't know about the comedy thing. I mean, uh, working nights, dumps like this, bucks nights, I mean, have you seen me before? Live? No. Oh, you lucky devil. And so close. <laughs> because, you see, I used to do an awful lot of audience participation, mainly because I used to get heckled a lot. And I used to think, well, you know, if I go out and dump a bit of shit on them, they won't do it to me. But it's pretty cheap humour, to be really honest with you, and I just... I, I want to stop doing that. Sorry, what was your name? <laughs> Rod. And what do you do, Rod? Um, Not sure? Sales. What do you sell? Telecommunications. Telecommunications. It's a bit like blood out of a stone, isn't it, right? And are you here with a, a partner tonight? No. That took a couple of seconds too, didn't it? Weighing it up. Thought you might make a move on that VB stubby a little later on. Now that's an example of what I'm talking about. Humiliating for Rod and frankly a little humiliating for me. And that's the kind of thing I want to move right away from. I'll be honest with you, I, uh... <laughs> I don't know what I am going to do. It's, um... It's been a pretty crazy few years for me. I've had some knocks. <laughs> I've had to roll with the punches. I've, um, I've travelled the world. I've tried to find a home. I've tried to find me. <laughs> and you know, I still reckon that I don't know anything about anything. But I reckon I may have learnt just one very simple lesson. And do you know what that lesson is, Rod? Well, let me ask you a question. Rod, what would you do if I sang out of tune? <laughs> would you stand up and walk out on me? Lend me your ears, Rod, and I'll sing you a song, and God damn it, I'll try not to sing out of key, excuse me. Because I'm gonna get by with a little help from my friends. I'm gonna get high with a little help from my friends. If there are any dealers in, I'm gonna get by with a little help from my friends, and you know, I'm just gonna come down here, and I'm gonna meet some friends. Hello? Sorry, my hand's very sweaty, and this costume probably smells a bit. What's your name? Leona, has it been all right, Leona? It's been lovely. Oh, that's so. I want to put that on my poster. Leona says, lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Rod, for being a nice person. Who have we got here? You're doing that. If I look at the table, I'll become invisible thing. <laughs> that generally doesn't work. What's your name? Alison, thanks a lot for coming, Alison. Been okay? It's been good. Are you enjoying the music? good, isn't it? It's kind of like we're all in a big lift together. It's got that sort of supermarket feel. You kind of feel like you should be listening to Who have we got here? Loretta? Lovely Loretta. Has it been okay? It's been great. See, that's what we're after. Not just lovely. Do you need anybody? I need someone to love. Could it be anybody? <laughs> You've heard the stories. I think so. <laughs> Who have we got over here? It's Skivvy Man. How are you? What's your name? Oh, well, 
My name's Craig Jenneth. I got a whole sentence there. Good on you, Craig. And Craig has been okay. Bloody marvellous. Now that's excellent. Thank you. I don't care if people are lying. And hi, denim on the bottom, denim at the top. You like to coordinate yourself. And that's good. What's your name? Grant. Can I shake your hand there, Grant? Thank you. I'm going to go back up here because this is quite exciting. This is like the finale. And look, what I'm aiming for here is a bit of a Michael Bolton feel. So if we could maybe just have a few arms in the air, a couple of lighters, in your own time. <laughs> one lighter, that poor desperate dick. I mean, look, you know, he needs some support. We've got two. Two. Oh, no, that's gone now. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Oh, one. Oh, no, about five. Oh, don't worry, I mean, it's only the fucking finale. That's okay, because I'm getting by with a little help from my friends.